um, as our last keynote, Eric Neuenschwander, um, who I'm welcoming to our virtual stage. He is the director of user privacy at a very small company you've probably never heard of called Apple. Um, there he's in charge of the privacy engineering efforts across Apple's products and services. Um, clearly, I have never used an Apple product in my life, as you can tell from the podium up here. Um, welcome, Eric. Thank you for joining us. The mic and the literal stage are yours. All right, great. Well, thank you, Amy. And uh, that was a great panel discussion. I want to say overall, you know, good afternoon. And thank you to Silicon Flatirons for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. I've had the opportunity to work at Apple, this small company, over the last 14 memorable years. And as the Director of User Privacy, I lead privacy engineering efforts across Apple's products and services. I was lucky enough to work on a number of firsts, including the first iPhone, but I'm equally proud of having founded Apple's privacy engineering team in 2011 to focus on the privacy by design approach that's been the North Star of Apple products and services, and in which encryption has played a huge role. I'm excited to be here for the relaunch of the encryption compendium, and I want to congratulate everyone involved for all of the hard work that went into developing an essential resource that will only become more valuable moving forward in the discussions. As we've heard today, the compendium extends back decades, beginning with the encryption policy debates of the mid 70s. 1976 was the year that advances in cryptography by Stanford researchers Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman first enabled encrypted communications to be explored by non government users. It was also the year of Apple's founding in the Los Altos, California home belonging to Steve Jobs' parents. Apple's proudly played a major role in the encryption debate since its inception, steadfastly defending privacy and security. Encryption helps people have trust in the products that they use. It provides critical properties to support that trust, including confidentiality of communication, authentication of the parties involved in the communication, and integrity of the content. Defending encryption is synonymous with defending our ability to freely and fully express ourselves in our digital lives. It's always been clear that our digital lives are worth protecting, and it's a need that's only gained greater urgency in the pandemic. Encryption has been instrumental in the growth of online communication, financial transactions, health data, other pieces of modern life, including storing our digital lives on mobile devices like laptops and smartphones. Apple's commitment to encryption has withstood not only the test of time, but also forceful external pressure, notably publicly from the US government. I hardly need to remind this audience that in 2016, we opposed a government order to develop new software that would have created a backdoor into iPhone. It was phrased in terms of one of the attackers in the San Bernardino terrorist attack, but we would have, we contended, weakened security for everyone. Though we'd done everything in our power to assist the FBI in its investigation up to that point, being asked to build software that would have the potential to unlock any iPhone was unacceptable. This wasn't a debate about our technical ability to write this code, but a question of our willingness to do so in light of the risks it would create for all of our users. While good intention, the request failed to recognize that no one can break encryption just for the good guys. The bad guys are always there looking to access people's personal, sensitive, financial, and medical data. Creating a method for anyone to ransack our most personal devices and all of the sensitive data stored within them would have opened Pandora's box. The very same day we received the order, Tim Cook published a letter to our customers explaining Apple's decision not to set a dangerous precedent by circumventing the security features we worked so hard to build. What Tim wrote half a decade ago still holds true today. He wrote, we can find no precedent for an American company being forced to expose its customers to a greater risk of attack. For years, cryptologists and national security experts have been warning against weakening encryption. Doing so would hurt only the well-meaning and law-abiding citizens who rely on companies like Apple to protect their data. Our decision not to build a backdoor was not one we took lightly, but we made the difficult choice to say no and instead chose to protect the personal data of more than 1 billion active Apple users around the world. And we continue to do so every day. Encryption and privacy are core values shared not only by all levels of the company, but also by our customers. That's why we build them into products from the outset with both privacy lawyers and privacy engineers partnered with development teams working on every single Apple device and service. That's why we've become known not only for supporting strong passcodes and end-to-end -end encrypted messaging, but also on-device intelligence, leaving users' data under their control for minimizing the data that we as Apple collect, for being transparent about the data we do collect 
and giving users choice. For example, Apple doesn't have access to the biometric data like your thumbprint or facial scan that you might use as a biometric credential to easily access your phone. That data is set up by you and stored on your device because we believe that your data, like your device, should be personal to you under your control. Just this year, we enabled app tracking transparency to give users a new choice. App Tracking Transparency, or ATT, prompts users asking your permission before any app tracks your activity across other companies' apps and websites. This puts you in control of your own information and your own online experience. Together with privacy nutrition labels, which clearly explain how an app uses your data rather than in confusing legalese, these tools give you both the understanding and the choice to control how your information is used. This is a key part of the online freedom I mentioned earlier, and it really shows how important individual awareness and understanding is to privacy. Technology can only be one part of the solution. As a technology company, we know that we share much of that responsibility, and we believe that privacy and technology must evolve in tandem. With that in mind, we unveiled additional privacy features at our worldwide developers conference earlier this year. Catching up on emails is stressful enough without your activity being tracked, so we introduced something called mail privacy protection, which closes off your inbox to spy pixels that track your email activity. This prevents senders from learning creepy information like your location and if and when you open a message. Similarly, new privacy features in the Safari browser hide your IP address from trackers, removing a commonly used method that's used to silently link your activity across different sites. If you spent time online, you've probably noticed the one product you absentmindedly clicked on haunts you for weeks on end across sites and even across devices. This is thanks to an entire industry of data brokers and ad tech firms that feed off tracking you without your knowledge. And this is exactly why we created these tools. In keeping with our commitment to transparency for our users, we also introduced the app privacy report which details just how often each app has used the access permissions you previously granted to things like phones, camera, and contacts. We unveiled an iCloud tool called Private Relay that encrypts all your website traffic so that not even Apple or your network provider can read it. We also introduced on-device speech recognition, which allows audio data collected by our voice assistant Siri to be processed right on your device. This way, your voice stays with you. You don't have to worry about unwanted audio recording. This directly addresses the most common concern consumers have expressed about voice assistance. It's a common misconception that machine learning and artificial intelligence require a treasure trove of data just to work well. And every day, our progress proves that on-device machine learning, like that which is used by Siri, delivers great features with great privacy. More recently, We've applied this privacy-first approach to another area, using technology to better protect children from abuse. In early August, we announced expanded child safety protections consisting of three separate tools to be released at a later date, communication safety and messages, expanded guidance in Siri and search, and child sexual abuse material detection in iCloud photos. These tools were designed to better protect children from sexual exploitation and grooming online. While we announce these three features together, they're distinctly different and worth exploring separately. Communication safety in messages is a feature parents or guardians can set up for child accounts that are part of family sharing. It warns children when they might be sending or receiving nude photos in the messages app. In either case, the photos blurred and a warning message appears along with additional resources to help them understand and safely navigate the situation. On-device machine learning analyzes the images. Apple never views them. The tool can also be used to notify parents of children under the age of 13 when their young children receive or send sexually explicit photos, showing parents a separate set of resources designed to foster the kind of healthy discussion that's so important to have in a world that only continues to go more digital. Syrian Search will also be equipped with resources to help in this effort. For example, by showing or telling users how they can report incidents of child exploitation. That update will also allow them to intervene when users knowingly seek out harmful and illegal material in this area. And the third tool 
is called Child Sexual Abuse Material Detection in iCloud Photos, which applies only to images that are uploaded to the iCloud Photos service and uses a hybrid client and server approach to together identify iCloud Photos accounts containing a collection of known child sexual abuse material or CSAM. The system uses hashes or digital fingerprints of known CSAM collected and verified by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, called NICMIC for short, and generates something that we call cryptographic safety vouchers for each image's comparison back to that set. Unlike other technologies that scan every image, our CSAM detection system was designed to mathematically enforce that Apple's human reviewers only have access to information about matched images once the collection of images crosses a threshold for that account. Ultimately, this enables us to identify and alert authorities of accounts with collections of known CSAM. Now, with all that's going on in the world today, you might ask, why these features and why now? The spread of material reflecting the abuse of children online is a worsening problem, infiltrating all corners of the internet. Criminals are using technology to remotely groom children and to share illegal content that goes under, undetected and then goes viral worsening the impact of the abuse every time it's shared. This is clearly an urgent need to make progress in this space. We knew that developing a technology that can identify collections of known CSAM while respecting user privacy, essentially protecting children while protecting privacy, would be exceptionally challenging. We also knew that we found alternatives, the alternatives of doing nothing or decrypting every single photo that our users store in iCloud to be unacceptable. And we knew that they would be unacceptable to our customers. We believe that we've developed a solution that allows us to stay true to our privacy values and use technology for good. We don't have to choose between privacy or protection. We can accomplish both. With CSAM detection in iCloud Photos, Apple does not learn anything about the data stored on a user's device. As an image is being uploaded to iCloud, it will have this new safety voucher, but nothing can be learned from that voucher unless it's from an illegal image as identified by NICMIC and a second recognized child safety organization. In one of the many checks and balances built into the system from the start, both these of these child safety organizations databases must list the photo as illegal. We also designed a threshold into the system to make it extremely accurate with an expected false positive rate of one in one trillion account per year. Finally, any account that's flagged goes to manual human review before any action is taken. So our system therefore is designed with both device side and server side components to ensure that nothing can be learned about the contents of the device. The device remains encrypted. We still don't hold the key. Still, I think the gut reaction of many, no doubt including some listening today was, hey, get out of my phone. That response is understandable, but I'd ask you to consider the alternatives. One alternative is to do nothing. Some have suggested that we simply should not attempt to build a feature that could detect collections of no CSAM stored in our service or a feature that could help protect children from grooming behavior. Others have suggested we adopt the practices that are common at other companies, just scan all the files stored in our systems in an attempt to detect and report CSAM. Compared to the feature we described, the risks to that approach are greater. There's less transparency about what's being detected less transparency about how it might be targeted to specific accounts. So such a system appears to us more vulnerable to external pressure. We are not naive to the threats we face, from those who would like to exploit this technology and its capabilities. After the San Bernardino attack, when the FBI requested that we develop software to break our own encryption, we never said we couldn't build that operating system. We said that we wouldn't because it would have impacted every single user's iPhone in a way that was unacceptable. Tim said it best in his remarks during a press conference around that time. He said, we have a responsibility to protect your data and your privacy. We will not shrink from this responsibility. So we've proposed those features to balance the utility of protecting children while preserving privacy. We heard that the concerns our CSAM scanning could be hijacked to search devices for something else entirely. And we're aware that this demand will come and our response couldn't be clearer. We will not build an operating system that would negatively impact the users who rely on their devices and on us. We will not adapt this feature for a purpose other than detecting collections of known CSAM. We don't believe that this feature erodes encryption 
and we remain as committed to privacy and encryption as ever. But while we, we believe we built robust protections into the features design and the other child safety features, we know that others may have ideas on how to strengthen these even further to protect children. We want to listen to that feedback. If you have substantive suggestions on how to build stronger child safety features, we want to hear them. At the end of the day, Apple builds consumer products and consumers face threats. Ransomware attacks on governments, corporations, and individuals are in the headlines every day. The threats we all face have never been so severe, and we're constantly looking to stay a step ahead so our users don't have to. Here's what we're up against. Attackers generally consider three things, the number of devices, the number of opportunities, and the value of access they might get. As of this past January, there are more than 1 billion iPhone users worldwide. And because smartphones can do so much, they represent several vectors for attack. You could be delivered malicious software by visiting a website, downloading a file, or otherwise attacked. And for attackers, a connected device like iPhone is absolutely worth their while for the wealth of personal, medical, and financial information they contain, including credit card details, contact information, photos and locations of our loved ones, and more. Threats that have been present since the day we launched the App Store we continually take into account. Last year alone, during a pandemic that drove work, school, and play inside and onto our devices, our app review process, which relies on human reviewers as well as technology, prevented more than $1.5 billion in fraudulent transactions. We also stopped nearly 1 million apps from making their way onto the app store and into the hands of users. I wanna clarify that not all of these applications were rejected for being malicious or otherwise misleading. Our strict guidelines on privacy, security, and spam overall make App Store the safest place to find secure, high-quality apps. Other apps might be rejected for a range of reasons. Last year, we rejected more than 48,000 apps for containing hidden or undocumented features. We rejected more than 150,000 apps for being spam, copycats, or misleading to users. And we rejected more than 215,000 apps for privacy violations. A strict app review process isn't the only factor that sets us apart. We also require that users download apps directly from the App Store, rather than sideloading them from an internet browser or an unauthorized third-party App Store. This prevents our users from being exposed to unvetted apps from questionable sources. This one move has done wonders to protect our users and build trust in the app ecosystem, not only among consumers, but also among developers. With more than 1 billion iPhone users and nearly 2 million apps available on the App Store, it's inevitable that problems still surface and successful attacks do occasionally occur. That being said, we're confident and security experts agree that Apple is more secure than our competitors. Coupled with the security and privacy protections that are built into our devices, the App Store presents users with a key line of defense. A 2020 report on malware attacks in mobile and fixed networks around the world found that the pandemic fueled a massive surge in attacks on mobile devices, and yet less than 2% of infections were attributed to iPhones. In comparison, Android devices represented nearly 27% of infections, over 10 times more. It's worth noting here that Android's operating system allows for sideloading. Users can download apps from just about anywhere, and the amount of malware on their devices reflects that. Our integrated system presents a different choice and one we believe has strong benefits to developers and users. It creates the security and the seamless user experience that we're known for. It's why consumers love our products. It's why they trust their devices to store their most sensitive personal information. It's why they download new apps from the App Store every day and then use and complete transactions in those apps, inspiring developers around the world to keep on dreaming and keep on creating. There is no absolute security, nor absolute privacy, but working toward this goal is always worth the effort. And the second we stop moving forward as an industry, we fall behind. I can only speak on behalf of one company, but I'm confident that we have the talent and the tenacity to make a difference for Apple users around the world. Much of our work is reliant on yours in this community, and I'm here today to recognize that important partnership and assure you of three things. Our commitment to encryption is steadfast. Our commitment to privacy and security is steadfast. And most importantly, our commitment to consumers is steadfast. Again, thank you very much.
Thanks so much, Eric. We have three student questions for you. Um, the first one comes from Richard, so I'm going to invite him to the stage. And like before, I'm going to disappear to give him lots of space to ask his question. Um, hi, Eric. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, speaking with us today. You said in your speech that the CCM detection technology was developed as a response to a worsening problem that you characterized as an urgent need. And you also said that the system will not be expanded to cover other types of content. How can you give an assurance that there won't be another urgent need in the future? So I think that the material that we're talking about is so far over, over the course of history, it's been unique in that it is widely recognized by countries around the world. There's a clear definition of the illegality and the harm to, harm to kids. There are plenty of regions that find other things to be uh, specifically bad for their region or given their history. But this one is effectively universal around the planet. So uh, you know, I, I would tend not to speak in terms of full absolutes. There might be in the future possibly some other urgent need but the properties of our system would say, even if there was a similar consensus around something else, that the actual implementation would change in a way that is noticeable to people. And so I think that there isn't anything that meets this same level. That's why we were motivated to approach this one singular issue with a whole suite of new technology. And I think it has been a growing problem that we as a tech provider should be devoted resources to addressing and mitigating. But other types of content may be addressed in the future. Is that correct? The, I mean, I'm speaking, you're saying over what I took your question to be is over the arc of human history sort of thing. This is a system that's designed for CSAM and has a number of protections to make it be exactly that. We're not going to design the system to do more. If there were something else that was an equal challenge, I think we would rise to meet that challenge as well. I don't know at all that it would be that system. It's this system. It's really a hypothetical, right? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, we, uh, we overall use, at, at the highest level, we have four pillars or principles that, that we use to organize our thinking when we're looking at um, some new feature or some new service that Apple might introduce. And in my mind, at least, they're ordered. And so first and foremost in that list is data minimization. We really seek to have the system process the minimum amount of data, or at least to expose Apple to the minimum amount of data to deliver great functionality. That's where, and you heard me talk about on-device intelligence as part of the talk. And on-device intelligence is something left under the user's control on their device. It isn't data that it gets exposed to Apple. It's a great technique for achieving data minimization. Um, other things like degrading the quality of data or limiting retention or other ways to, to minimize data. Um, second is restricting the use of that data. So ensuring that it's only used for the intended purposes. And that has 
Sometimes a policy component, things like access control lists or whatever, have a role to play, limiting who can get data, uh, who can see data once it's been collected. But there are also technical means that we can take to degrade that data away from other uses. So things like local differential privacy is a technology we've used, and this, in short, randomizes the data on the device before it ever comes up for analysis. And that means that it only works to analyze that data in aggregate from a number of different submissions. When you get an individual piece of data, you can't conclude anything from it. When you get a large collection of data, you can learn trends from that. And that's a much more powerful way than simply collecting individual items and then saying, oh, we'll only look at the aggregates. We're actually imposing a technical control so that the data is only useful once aggregated. It's only informative once aggregated. So that would be a way of looking at use limitation. Transparency and control is the third pillar. And these are very important. It's important to be transparent to users and to have them be able to have control over data collection. But you'll note it comes after the other two. It's only for after first asking the question of, is this data necessary at all? And how can we restrict that use down to the minimum to provide the great functionality? Yes, you should have transparency, you should have control. And then last, but not least, not really fourth in the list, is security. Security has two different aspects to it. Security underpins all the three things I already talked about. If a user is supposed to have control over something and there's a way for an attacker to evade that control, that's a breach of security. And it undermines the notion that you've given control over access to say that sensor or that data. But security also has the role to play in encryption, what we're talking about today. And that's encryption both of data at rest and data in motion. Encryption provides the capability to help assure things like the confidentiality of users' data. And so when we think about things like our iMessage communication service, end-to-end -end encrypted between the sending and receiving devices, so that even though those messages, messages transit Apple's servers, uh, even though if you're on an airplane, like, like maybe people will get back to doing and the message can't be delivered, and so it's going to be held by the server, it's held encrypted with keys that Apple never possesses, and that means that we're able to provide privacy assurances around that service built directly on top of the encryption primitives and the design of that algorithm. So those are the four things that we reliably look at as lenses to apply to each problem. And then for any given uh, more specific project that we're talking about, we start looking at individual uh, threats or risks and the assurances around privacy that we want to be able to provide users for the specific thing we're designing. Great, thanks. Thank you. Our last student question is going to be Gabe. Hello, uh, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. And uh, it's a pleasure to meet you virtually. <laughs> Thanks, uh, you too. <laughs> so I have uh, a question for you, or, or, or two rather, and they're on uh, the subjects that you've been talking about today. And the first is that the CSAM uh, detection material and uh, neural hash, it, it's, as you've said, it's a lot more secure because of the on-device scanning that you've done and the way that you've implemented it, as opposed to other players in the industry that may have on server scanning in a way that you uh, said is less transparent or it, it enables greater access to clients data. But what would you say to people who are skeptical of this approach only in that it may have broached a new territory where client side scanning is now just the beginning of something else, where you, it may not be a threat in the way that you have rolled it out or with the scope that you've said it is, but it becomes an area that's now more familiar to consumers and that hurts civil liberties in general going forward. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a couple different directions to unpack that. Um, I guess, first I would say, you, know, you, you mentioned in the way that you've implemented it, I think that that can lead to a misconception that this is something that we're rolling out now. And it's something that we brought out and described and proposed We'd done enough work to feel confident that it was something that could be implemented. But the phase that we're in for people that have those concerns is one of discussion, listening, and dialogue. And so this isn't something that, uh, that we're, we're fixed on in terms of the approach. What we're fixed on is that it is something that we think we need to do across child safety to do more to disrupt grooming, to do, do more to disrupt this kind of hoarding and exchange of material. Um, 
specifically for why we think it has that greater protection and how people interpret it, I, I'm not quite sure that we've all agreed on the words. I wouldn't call it client-side scanning because client-side scanning would seem to imply that there's a result known based on data on the device. And that's not possible under the system. It requires the server-side processing and server-side storage of the data and the result of the, uh, the first half of the private set intersection protocol with the part that I think people would call the, the matching or the scanning. The way it's designed, the result isn't knowable until a threshold of material has been accumulated within an account. These are, these are properties of the math of the system. And that's very different from what I think people would intuitively understand client-side scanning to me. Um, maybe that means we need different words. Maybe it just means we need to be more precise. And so then to your third point, I think it's important to have these norms and properties in a system that we've designed a number of different checks into the protocol, into the approach, so that we feel that this is a system that would actually work very solidly to not be able to be expanded beyond the scope that we've discussed without the properties without that being transparent and required to be transparent at a technical level. I think those are key properties in the system that we propose and a system that we rolled out would need to, in my opinion, at least have those implemented in some way, shape or form. And the current uh, state of the art that, that we saw or we were able to conceive of for a scanning based on server held data on servers didn't have those properties. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. And uh, underlying everything that you've just uh, described right there seems to be, as you were saying, like a commitment to strong normative values. And I was wondering, and you know, you protect U.S. citizens very strongly uh, in that regard. And I was wondering if, in your opinion, Apple has that same level of commitment to citizens of other countries and other locations. Okay, I want to I want to answer that generally, and then make sure I, because I feel like you're asking in the context of the proposed features. So I'll come back to that too. First. We've said, I didn't work it in today, but privacy is a fundamental human right. That's a belief of the company. And if you think something's a fundamental human right, that means you apply it universally and you don't consider it uh, to be one thing for a US person and another thing for another person. So absolutely, that's our approach to privacy. That's underpinned by the fact that we have our one global operating system that we ship features in the same way. Um, for the CSIM detection and iCloud photos feature specifically, it's uh, something that in our proposal, we had only completed our analysis to even contemplate launching in the US. And it would be additional analyses about the risks to users of our products before we would expand it beyond the US. We're most familiar with US law, US policy, and the US organizations that support child safety. And that's still going to be our focus as we look at uh, what kind of features we want to ship. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you. I'm going to start turning to the questions that we have that came in over Zoom. Um, give me a second to get to I keep trying to push my mouse from over here to over here, forgetting that they're not connected to one another. Not yet. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a feature in, in Mac OS Monterey and iOS 15. <laughs> Thank you. Keep, keep working on that. <laughs> um, so Andrew Zach asks, um, can Apple claim that iMessage with communication safety turned on is still end-to-end -end encrypted if it detects explicit images? Um, it may not be definitionally client-side scanning, which you just spoke to, but is it still true end-to-end -end encryption? Okay. Um, so, so what I just spoke to, I, 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 I want to really draw a clear line first. And um, first I'll say the clear line I have to draw now is Apple's fault. We introduced three things all at once. So I have to talk about all three things now because it's what we talked about and it's confusing. It's too confusing. And so right now, what we just did, and I'm drawing the clear line for everybody, is we moved from the prior question, which was about our iCloud photos feature. And now we're talking about the communication safety and messages feature, which is totally fair. But everything that I was talking about in terms of the design of the scanning applies to that feature. And I have to talk about this other feature differently. Um, that said, it's still obviously a valid question. So can Apple still contend that iMessage is end-to-end -end encrypted? There's obviously very active debate on this. Um, my personal view is that end-to-end -end encryption 
protects communications from unwanted or unintended disclosure to someone who's not party to the communication. That's what I think as technologists, the assurance that we can provide people. Um, it doesn't say that if uh, you message me right now that everybody in this conference won't see it because I could hold my phone up to the screen and, and then everybody would see the message and we don't have a technical way to prevent that, right? So that's why I think that it makes sense when we're talking about end-to-end -end encryption to look at the unwanted, unintended disclosure and the feature that we propose leaves any notification to the parent under the control of the child who is a party to the communication. Uh, that doesn't mean that the analysis is done. That doesn't mean that, oh, well, since you know, no, no keys were harmed in the making of the feature, it's obviously a good feature. It's still quite right to ask questions about the use, abuse, misuse of this feature. And that's part of what uh, we're discussing with a number of experts. But I, as a, as a uh, person who considers himself a staunch defender of encryption and works at a company who's uh, very keen on encryption, I'm very worried about trying to make broader claims on what the technology can support when we want to signal to anyone who would undermine end-to-end -end encryption uh, where, where those lines should be. We have a question from Matt Blaze. Um, I like the idea of our first keynote speaker asking questions of our second keynote speaker. Um, asking, would detecting terrorist training materials have been considered an equally urgent need immediately post 9-11? Sorry, was that, a, was that a statement or a question? Um, I guess, would, would we have considered it? Detecting I, terrorists, so you're talking I, about CSAM as, a, as yeah. an urgent need. Would terrorist training materials have, at the time, immediately post 9-11, have been considered an equally urgent need? Right, and... and um, it's tough to, you know, retrospectively talk about that hypothetical. If I, if I give just my gloss of what I think the properties were at that time, it wasn't that there was a globally, uh, I, two things. That one, there wasn't a globally identified definition of exactly what material like that would be. And two, uh, there wasn't a global norm that said that the mere possession of that material was itself illegal. You know, I'm on the engineering side, not, not a lawyer, so I don't want to make too many assertions about what's illegal or illegal, but uh, through our work on this feature, it's, it's just not uh, acceptable. It's not acceptable under the law to hold the material when we're talking about CSAM or CSAM. Um, there's been no such push in the U.S. and therefore no such push, uh, you know, at a wide ranging globally. Uh, across many countries to make that same definition around a set of defined material. So I don't see them as being the same. Um, I think implicit in that question is, wouldn't have there have been a lot of pressure to go use this nifty tool uh, to go look for terrorist material? And uh, again, it's hypothetical, but sure, that seems plausible to me. I think that for cloud services that process material in cloud services, that pressure is technically greater because the ease with which a search can be particularized and the ease with which uh, an algorithm can be modified are lower than in a system where you have a hybrid approach that involves the device and the server, the device attesting to some aspect of the algorithm uh, as we roll out our operating systems gives some additional properties that I think help provide disincentives or raise the costs of scope creep. So you've talked a little bit in response to a couple questions about the fact that this isn't something that's actively being implemented right now. Um, one of the questions talks about how you have started a process of collecting input. Um, and they ask, is there a structured plan for ensuring transparency in that process that Apple plans to follow? Um, and is there, will that plan include, um, if the plan exists, I'm assuming, um, the creation of documents to codify your findings, such as through a human rights impact assessment. So we've been um, very, we think the transparency around what we're proposing is critical to improving trust. Part of why I think there's been able to be so much engagement on our proposal is the uh, bunch of material, the wealth of material that we published as part of the initial announcement. We're going to continue to be transparent about the choices and trade-offs as we move forward with the features. 
I'm going to ask, there's two questions I kind of want to ask together, if possible. Um, to start, you, there have been, I think the first question refers to a few different systems. For example, um, it says researchers have identified flaws in some of the privacy tech that asked, Apple has pushed in the past and references um, privacy loss parameters and differential privacy and the neural hash collisions, and then talks about that gets to a question of um, how should consumers approach having confidence in Apple's privacy efforts, um, given kind of, I think, what they're identifying as a discrepancy between the math and the talking points. And then this, the second question kind of relates to this in a way, I'm getting to that question of trust, of given that you're scanning children's incoming communications, um, is there any special consideration that children should have about the fact that um, their communications are now being scanned coming into or coming through the iPhone, um, that maybe what, the, what happens on the iPhone isn't staying on the iPhone, um, kind of referencing that public communications piece as well? Um, okay, you put them together. I, I see the questions as a little bit separate, but I'll, let, me, let me hit them both starting maybe with the second one is a little bit simpler. Um, so a child will know that the communications coming in through the messages app are being scanned. Well, so first of all, what happens on the device in that context is just on the device. The notification piece is separately under the child's control. And again, going back to the technical definition of end-to-end -end encryption, I, I find this to be, uh, again, somewhat just challenging to, to draw a line technically, because let's say I send you a message in the messages application over iMessage, uh, that message is decrypted and processed just to be rendered onto the screen, to be displayed so that you can read it. If it's a photo or if it's a text, your device is, uh, is processing those bits. Under our communication safety feature, it additionally processes the bits using a classifier to decide if an image that came in is, is maybe a nude image. And then it further renders those bits a little bit differently. It doesn't just show you the image, it shows you a blurred out version of the image. And all of this is to service you. A nude image came in, you maybe didn't want to see it, it's processing um, to blur it out or it would process it to show it to you. And, and this is just local processing. We can call it client-side scanning, but uh, it, it is, the, is already being processed by your device just to provide the functionality to you, which is what comm safety is there for. Separately on top of that, uh, there's an additional step that if you confirm the parent could have set up a, a notification and there's been a lot of conversation about the utility of those notifications and how a child will really interact with them, especially across a range of years. And um, we continue to be interested in experts' uh, opinions and, and research studies on, on the notification piece. But that's separate, I think, from the blurring and the blurring is a feature which is only occurring on the, on the device. So I see those as pretty different. Um, broader with you know some going back to to our our launch of uh, local differential privacy and such i think you said that there's a discrepancy maybe between the math and and the words or the description i i don't think there's a discrepancy but what we saw in, in the local differential privacy example is a great example is that there are limits to what math can assert or assure uh when you deploy and embed a system that runs on devices and uses the internet there are a bunch of things involved which math has nothing to say about and so one of the critiques of local of our differential privacy was, well, um, I'm going to try not to make this be like too often the weeds technical, but there's this idea of epsilon, which relates to the, um, the amount of randomization or the amount of privacy risk of, of the submission. And there's an additional concept called a privacy budget, which basically says don't take too much data or you'll end up with an epsilon that grows to infinity. And some people said, well, this device keeps submitting data. And so Apple shipped an infinite epsilon and that's really bad for privacy. Well, within the math, there isn't a way to answer that question, but within the system, the packets that are collected from users' devices don't have any identifying characteristics retained. A real technical person would say, ah, but it has the IP address. And my response is yes, the IP address is dropped at the network boundary and not held by the system that processes the data. So there's no IP address that's left with the packets of data that get processed to do the analysis. 
And so the basic assertion of, well, if a device keeps sending information, then you have a perfect idea of Eric over time, presumes that the system can actually go find two pieces of information and relate them together, let alone assigning them back to Eric. And we design different protections into the system to protect, to, to prevent that. Everything I just said has nothing to do with differential privacy, though. It's about packets on the internet and storage and databases and a bunch of things that fall outside of what differential privacy has anything to say about. That was a challenge, and that continues to be a challenge with features we roll out, where we have a level of protection which is technical, based on math, based on crypto, based on whatever, and what that system could possibly say about a system as, uh, sorry, what that mathematics could possibly say about a system deployed in the real world. This is a, a communication challenge. And to, to try to get to the last part, I think, of that question, so then how to assure trust in, in these systems which have technical complexity? I think it comes down to both the transparency that we provide in terms of our descriptions of the assurances and of the implementation and wherever possible, where we can put that implementation or that code into the hands of people through the operating system image so that if we have it wrong, somebody will, will call that out. And this isn't to presume or to say or to claim that out of our billion users, very many of them have the technical wherewithal or the time or the resources to do that. But it doesn't take all of them. It takes, in, in a world of uh, Twitter, it takes one to, to find it, to tweet it out. And then uh, if we were trying to pull a fast one, if anybody who tries to pull a fast one, the, the jig is kind of up at that point. And so really, I think that the transparency in terms of our descriptions and the transparency where we can in terms of the code give a lot of avenues for people to increase their assurance around the claims that we make. Thank you so much. You can stay with us a little bit over time. I appreciate that. Thanks for giving so much of your time um, for talking through what you're doing um, and where you might go next. So thanks for sharing some time with us. I appreciate it. Thank you, especially to the students for the great questions, but for all the questions and engagement. Thank you. So that concludes